Hello, and welcome to this presentation, The Grey Nuns and the Great Hunger. On behalf of the Knights of Columbus Museum, thank you for joining this session, which is one of several online programs for the benefit of museum patrons. Before we begin, please note that the Knights of Columbus Museum remains closed. For updates about the museum and its events and offerings, visit kofcmuseum.org or follow the museum on social media channels at KOFC Museum. During the presentation, you may submit questions at any point using the questions utility. I'll address a selection of your questions to our presenter in the Q&A session following his talk, which should last approximately 35 to 40 minutes. With us today is Dr. Jason King, a Montreal native and historian at Ireland's National Famine Museum in Strokestown Park and the Irish Heritage Trust. Jason is no stranger to the Knights of Columbus Museum, nor is his topic. In 2016, the museum opened an exhibition titled Fleeing Famine, Irish Immigration to North America, 1845 to 1860. Jason visited during that show, and he is associated with Dr. Christine Keneally of Ireland's Great Hunger Institute and Museum at Quinnipiac University in Hamden, Connecticut, as well as with last week's presenter, Dr. Mark McGowan of the University of Toronto. Jason is, however, our first presenter to do so from across the Atlantic. And we know that the cross-Atlantic journey of the mid-19th century was on the order of a month in duration and arduous in many other ways. People often arrived in North America sick and undernourished, and some, in fact, did not survive the trip. On arrival, often there was no family or friends to greet immigrants to a foreign land. Some, however, did benefit richly from the ministry of the Sisters of Charity of Montreal, whose dedication in caring for the sick as well as widows and orphans left destitute and alone is well documented. Jason, you have researched these historical accounts and we are eager to learn from you. The program is yours. Good afternoon and good evening from uh, here in Dublin. It's a great pleasure and a real honor for me to speak to you today about the Grey Nuns and the Great Hunger. And I'd like to thank you, Peter, and the Knights of Columbus Museum for your kind invitation today. As you noted, I work at the National Famine Museum in Strokestown Park in County Roscommon, and I've collaborated with the Knights of Columbus Museum on a number of occasions, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity now to extend that collaboration online. For my talk today, I want to explore the legacy of the Grey Nuns or Sisters of Charity who cared for famine Irish emigrants in Montreal in 1847. During the spring and summer of that year, over 100,000 Irish people fled to British North America or Canada to escape from the Great Hunger in Ireland, and approximately 70,000 of them arrived in Montreal, which had a population of less than 50,000 at the time. Proportionally, that would be equivalent to over 1 million refugees arriving in the greater New Haven area in the space of about three months today. The most detailed and evocative eyewitness accounts of their arrival and their suffering can be found in the French language annals of the Grey Nuns who cared for them in Montreal's fever sheds. Approximately 6,000 Irish emigrants perished in those fever sheds uh, and are buried in what is uh, is North America's largest mass famine grave. As Peter mentioned, Professor Christine Keneally and I curated an exhibit at Quinnipiac University entitled Saving the Famine Irish, the Grey Nuns and the Great Hunger that is based on their annals as well as a painting by Quebec artist Théophile Hamel, which you can see on both sides of the uh, flyer on screen and that I will be focusing on in some detail today. Our exhibit has traveled extensively in the United States, in Canada, and Ireland, uh, where it recently closed at the National Famine Museum at Strokestown Park, where I work. The Grey Nuns annals contain over 500 pages of first-hand testimonies that have been digitized, transcribed, and translated into English, which can be freely accessed at the URL you see at the top of your screen, famonearchive.nuigalway.ie. In his preface to this digital archive, 
Ireland's president, Michael D. Higgins, has stated that, quote, it is impossible to imagine the pain, fear, despair, suffering, and suffering of these emigrants, many of whom lost beloved family members on their journey. As a country, we owe an enormous debt of gratitude to the Grey Nuns who cared for so many Irish workers and orphans who were left destitute, impoverished, and alone in a strange country. This virtual archive is a very important project which allows us to finally acknowledge the generosity and enormous humanity of those wonderful sisters whose great kindness and compassion during one of the worst moments in our country's history must never be forgotten. For my talk today, I want to revisit the Grey Nuns accounts in light of our own experiences of the COVID-19 pandemic. More specifically, I want to make three points. First, I want to suggest that the Grey Nuns annals register their compassion, devotion, and self-sacrifice specifically as caregivers, whose roles we've become ever more appreciative of in the past few months. My second point is that their records and Hamel's paintings comprise a set of what I describe as mortuary spectacles in which desperate Irish emigrants are compressed into an anonymous mass of stricken fever victims and stacks of corpses. Yet these mortuary spectacles also challenge us to seek individual stories of famine emigrants who survived the fever sheds to start new families and lives overseas. My third point then is that tracing these stories of their descendants can help put a face on the figure of the individual famine migrant and help inspire a sense of resilience in the midst of our own pandemic. Since Marguerite Duville had founded the Sisters of Charity or Grey Nuns in 1738, they'd been led by a succession of strong women, including in 1847, Mother Superior Elizabeth McMullen. The term Grey Nuns or Sir Gris in French is derived from the color of their habit, but it is also pejorative, implying tipsy or drunken women on account of the fact that their founder, Marguerite Duville's late husband, was an alcohol trader with native peoples, which was illegal at the time. By the 19th century, however, the term Grey Nuns had become a badge of honor for the Sisters of Charity. Under the leadership of Mother Superior Elizabeth McMullen, the Grey Nuns first entered the fever sheds of Montreal on June 9, 1847, which is what you see being depicted in the image on screen. They were immediately confronted by a scene of mass suffering and death, as they recall in their annals, and I quote, what a spectacle unraveled in the eyes of this good mother and her company. Hundreds of people were laying there, most of them on bare planks, pell-mell, men, women, and children. The moribund and cadavers are crowded in the same shelter. While, though, while, while there are those that lie on the keys or on pieces of wood, thrown here and there along the river. This mortuary spectacle would recur throughout the summer of 1847. The Grey Nuns were in fact one of three orders of French Canadian female religious who cared for famine emigrants in Montreal. We see them, if you look at my cursor, uh, in the foreground of the painting, the first order of nuns in the image. Two weeks after they entered the fever sheds, the Grey Nuns were forced to withdraw on June 24th, 1847, because of illness and seven fatalities within their ranks. They were replaced by the Sisters of Providence, the second order of nuns that you see in the image, a female religious community founded only three years earlier by Emily Tavernier Gamelin in 1844. The third order of nuns to care for the famine Irish, you see in the back of the image there, were the religious hospitalers of St. Joseph's, a, close, a cloistered order that received special permission to leave their convent, and they replaced the Sisters of Providence after they too succumbed to the typhus epidemic in July of 1847. These three orders of nuns are depicted caring for famine emigrants in Theophile Hamel's painting, Le Typhus, which provides the only eyewitness image of Irish death and suffering in North America in 1847. It is a unique painting that corresponds closely with the annals of the Grey Nuns, and as I've said, I want to examine it in some detail. 
in the mid 19th century, Théophile Hamel was one of Quebec's most successful painters. He was born in 1817 near Quebec City and became apprenticed at the age of 16. He'd set out for a grand tour of Europe, as many artists did, to learn his craft and make copies of European masterpieces in 1843, including Theodore Jericho's Raft of the Medusa, a great classic uh, created in 1819. Hamel was living in Montreal in 1847 when he witnessed the famine Irish migration and was commissioned by the city's bishop, Ignace Bourget, to paint Le Typhus on August 13th of that year. Hamel completed and installed the painting on May 21st, 1848, in the ceiling of the city's Notre Dame de Bon Secours Church, where it can still be seen today. The painting, Le Typhus, is iconic in the most profound sense of the term. It is not simply a commemorative image, but a medium of intercession. It was envisioned and commissioned to depict the typhus disease seeking an entrance into the city, but stopped at its gates by the Virgin Mary's powerful protection. And you see her at the top left-hand corner of the image. Indeed, the threat of typhus is portrayed quite literally as the Virgin Mary appears not only to be perched on billowing clouds, but also to block the miasma and vapors, which were mistakenly believed to cause typhus and infectious disease in the mid 19th century. The painting, as I've noted, also conveys the experiences, uh, the experiences of the three orders of nuns who came to care for Irish famine emigrants in the foreground and the middle ground of the painting against the backdrop of a fever shed and a panoramic vision of the city. Le Typhus is also a history painting in this regard in that it recalls each of these three orders of nuns who never in fact worked alongside one another, but rather worked in succession, first the Grey Nuns, then the Sisters of Providence, then the Religious Hospitalers of St. Joseph. All three of them are layered into the same image uh, over the course of the summer of 1847. My broader point though, really the point I want to make about the painting is that it is unique in its visual rendering of famine Irish death and suffering, and that it conveys not only Hamel's impressions of anguished Irish emigrants, but it also incorporates figures from Theodore Jericho's Raft of the Medusa, the defining masterpiece of 19th century mortality. Indeed, Hamel was inspired by Jericho's depiction of shipwrecked victims in a moment of crisis and his graphic portrayal of death. Jericho had completed the raft of the Medusa in 1819, three years after the ship Medusa became marooned on a sandbar off the coast of Senegal and members of its crew were cast adrift in a ramshackle vessel for 10 days during which they succumbed to cannibalism and murder before being rescued by another ship, the Argus. The painting captures the moment they desperately signal the Argus as it begins to disappear over the horizon. And you can see the ship, the Argus, just the faintest of flecks in the horizon in, uh, in, in Jericho's painting. In his composition of the painting, Jericho famously brought home body parts from the morgue and interviewed the raft survivors in Paris to depict their suffering in extremists. Indeed, Jericho depicts the very moment in which the survivors are roused by the prospect of rescue while others have succumbed to despair. This tension between the expectation of salvation and the abandonment of hope is at the heart of the painting, which divides the sailor signaling the Argus in the top right hand corner uh, for the crouched figure in the bottom left, who's cradling a corpse and displays a vacant stare. This despairing figure is precisely the one that Theophile Hamel incorporates in his own painting, Le Typhus. He is diagonally contrasted in Hamel's painting with the Virgin Mary, who draws the viewer's line of vision from her perch on billowing clouds on the top left down to his despondent posture in the bottom right, as he too cradles a corpse. As in the Wrath of the Medusa, 
as in the raft in the Medusa, the figure seems oblivious to his surroundings beyond hope of rescue and the reach of the female religious sisters who provide succor and the prospect of salvation. Furthermore, in, as in Jericho's painting, he seems already to have joined the ranks of the dead whose scattered bodies and limbs lie haphazardly amongst the living. Indeed, Hamel's composition of clustered living and dead bodies thronged together in a seething mass, and his close-up portrayal of their mental anguish and physical suffering is directly influenced by Jericho, who helped him envision this scene as a harrowing mortuary spectacle. Such images of famine Irish death and suffering recur in the annals of the Grey Nuns. From the moment of their arrival in the sheds in the summer of 1847, their annals repeatedly emphasize the bodily suffering and mass mortality of Irish fever victims. I want to examine a couple of somewhat lengthy passages from their annals over the next couple of minutes. In their own words in the annals, the Grey Nuns recall, and I quote, it's the passage we have on screen, words are lacking to express the hideous state in which the sick found themselves, up to three of them in the same bed or cots, to be more exact, that had been hastily fashioned and gave the impression that they were caskets. When touring the sheds, we would find cadavers exhaling an insufferable infection, lying in the same bed as those that still breathed. The number of sick was so considerable that we at some point counted 1,100 of them, some of whom had been dead for a few hours before we'd noticed. One day, a sister passing one of those sheds saw a poor afflicted that appeared restless. She came near his cot and saw that he was attempting to push off two dead bodies between when she was lying down. In spite of the delirium that deprived him of some of his faculties, the sight of those cadavers, one black as coal, the other, in contrast, yellow like saffron, caused him such a fright that it momentarily brought him back to his senses. Once delivered from his two companions, he fell back in his previous state of insensibility, and the next day it was his turn to join the ranks of the dead. We could cite a thousand traits of this kind, but it is impossible to report them all. The spectacle of helpless Irish infants being removed by the sisters from the breasts of their stricken mothers, as we see in the painting, also recurs throughout the Grey Nun's annals. They record that, and I quote again, what is even more heart-wrenching is to see little children, only a few months old, abandoned due to the death of their mothers. During these visits, we found more than one young child lying with mothers who no longer existed, suckling their breasts to find some nourishment. These mortuary scenes of stricken parents and oblivious children continued on a daily basis. If we turn to the second lengthy passage that I want to examine, again from the Annals of the Grey Nuns, and I quote, the priests, the nuns, linger in these scenes of desolation to temper the bitterness with words of peace and resignation. Sister Montgolfier, traversing the enclosure, met a little girl of 11 or 12 years old who was looking for her mother. She'd been transported to Montreal before her. The good sister took her affectionately by the hand and went with her from bedside to bedside. All anxious, the little one looked, left and right, her little heart beating with fear and hope. All of a sudden, she heard a most tender exclamation, oh mother, but in embracing her mother, her little arms held a moribund on her last breaths. Another morning, Sister Montgolfier was completing her usual visits when she visited, when she noticed that young children had entered the enclosure where their dead father lay. These poor little ones were calling him, caressing him, and playing amongst themselves. Worried about the fatigue that this illness could cause, the vigilant sisters hastened to make the young children back away, but with pain. Their father was but a cadaver. Such force did she need to take these children away while hearing their heartbreaking cries. She guided them to the sheds designated for children, and a few days later, she placed them happily with a family. The Grey Nuns annals thus capture the very moment in which Irish families were torn asunder. They provide an unrivaled sense of the immediacy and the intimacy of death and suffering within the sheds. It's important to note, however, that the sisters' priority was to save the souls of these Irish famine victims and their children 
even more than their lives. Indeed, there's an intense sense of anxiety in their annals about the threat of proselytization or religious conversion. While there's limited evidence of actual religious conversions taking place within the fever sheds in 1847, the fear of them was intense. For example, the Grey Nuns annals recount that Sister Collins, quote, in seeing Protestant ministers circulating in the shelters, she made a good guard against those that wished to indoctrinate. Likewise, Father Richards, the first English language priest for Irish Catholics in Montreal, who ultimately fell victim to typhus himself in July of 1847, is recorded taking charge of famine orphans and insisting that, quote, a shed specifically be designated for children in the fear that the Protestants would seize the poor little ones. On July the 16th, 1847, Sister Collins is recalled once again, quote, having absented herself for a few moments from the bedside of her patients, a Protestant minister exerted his propaganda and by consequence argued for the alleged reform. But the sister entered suddenly, her patients screaming. The Grey Nuns also recount an increasing sense of tension in the late summer of 1847 when, quote, a great number of Protestants circulated in the shelters and saw with an envious eye the happy catch that the charity and selflessness of our sisters and priests were making daily. A great number converted to Catholicism, children especially were collected with care to be placed in good families. The Grey Nuns Annals also attest, on the other hand, more positively, to their spirit of female fellowship. They're written from the viewpoint of the entire community and often collapse any distinction between the past and present tense or individual and collective endeavors. In an inscribing and reciting the annals, the Grey Nuns do not merely summon to memory the deeds of their fellow sisters and predecessors, but they also seek to relive their experiences. Their annal is a collective biography of a religious community in which they speak with one voice. It's important to emphasize, however, that the Grey Nuns annals are also historically accurate and can be corroborated with contemporary press accounts. For example, I want to emphasize a small detail in the middle background of the right-hand side of Tiafiel Hamel's painting, Le Typhus, which is corroborated in both the annals of the Grey Nuns and contemporary press accounts, which took me a long time to notice. Because the painting is installed in the ceiling of the vestibule of Bonsecour Church, where it is not particularly well lit, you have to crane your neck to see it, and depending on the quality of the light, it is easy to miss background details. It was only after I viewed it a number of times and was becoming familiar with the annals of the Grey Nuns that I noticed a particular background detail which I'd missed many times before. The grieving husband cradling his dead wife. I'll point it out on the cursor. You see it over my right hand shoulder there and then in the close up of the image in the background uh, behind the figure of the despondent survivor. This figure of the grieving husband cradling his dead wife is also captured in the Annals of the Grey Nuns. And I want to quote the passage which you see on screen. One day came a man from Grosil, where he had remained upon his arrival being too sick to be transported to Montreal, where his wife, who was in good health, was sent with everyone else who had yet to be infected with the contagion. This poor man was looking everywhere for his wife without being able to find her. Finally, he enters the sheds and looks on every cot to no avail. He goes out to pursue his search. While crossing the courtyard, he sees a great number of dead bodies. He comes nearer to examine them more closely. What does he see? The inanimate body of his wife, whom he was looking for all this time. He takes her in his arms, seeming to doubt that she's in fact dead. He wants to bring her back to life, talks to her, calls her by her name, kisses her tenderly. But for all of these demonstrations, the only answer he receives is death's silence. Once he is convinced that she no longer exists, he abandons himself to his pain. The air is filled with cries and sobs. The spectacle was most heart-wrenching. 
scenes of this nature occur several times a day. The same spectacle recorded here is also reported more fleetingly in the Montreal Transcript newspaper on the date of June the 19th, 1847. And again, I quote, many cases of extreme distress came to our knowledge during a recent visit to the sheds. We met with one poor heartbroken man whose children were in the hospital at Beausville and whose wife was uttering her last sigh in our shed. The Grey Nuns witnessed scenes like this every day, but it is only through cross-referencing between their annals and contemporary press accounts that we can trace them to their historical moment of origin. Despite these harrowing scenes, the Grey Nuns also recorded remarkable stories of Irish resilience and survival. They recount how a widow named Suzanne Brown became separated from her youngest daughter Rose in Montreal's fever sheds after she had nearly succumbed to typhus only to recover from her illness but having lost contact with her child. The Annal records this incident in some detail and again I want to quote. Suzanne Brown was born in Ireland to an affluent family who were stripped of their assets by misfortune. She was left widowed with her three children George, Bridget and Rose and the courageous woman left her homeland to seek fortune abroad. She was traveling to Quebec with a group of Irish immigrants when she was struck down at sea by the contagion. From Quebec, she could nevertheless be transported to Montreal, but on her arrival, she became so sick that as it was unlikely she would recover, and as she, was, as she seemed unconscious, we entrusted her son George to the parish priest of St. Hugh, her eldest daughter Bridget to the Grey Nuns, and Rose, her youngest, was adopted by a courageous Irish woman whose name we unfortunately did not retain before her mother returned to health against all odds. While kind of convalescing under the care of the Grey Nuns, Suzanne Brown continued to search for her daughter until, quote, days and weeks passed with no clues to enlighten her. She also helped to educate some of the Irish orphans whom the Grey Nuns had taken in. And once again, if we turn to a somewhat lengthy passage from the Grey Nuns' annals, we can see that they recall, and I quote, when she found herself surrounded by the orphans who absorbed her teachings like thirsty earth absorbs the dew, she thought of her little Rose. If I had her here with me, she said, I would teach her with all the others. With this weighing on her mind one March evening, she attended a holy sacrament in St. Patrick's Church. In the silence of the ceremony, she was disturbed from her contemplation by the sound of a marble rolling on the floor, which came to rest in the folds of her clothes. She had barely raised her eyes when she saw a little girl, aged three or four, running to collect it. Is this not my little Rose? She said, trembling with emotion. Indeed, it was this child who she mourned and thought she'd lost forever, now returned to her at this moment by our Lord, and by instinct she reached out. However, her adoptive mother, who'd missed nothing of what happened, intervened and protested. Before the ceremony had even finished, both women went to the sacristy to submit the case to Father Dowd. He did not delay in resolving the issue, and that very evening, Madame Brown triumphed bringing back to the refuge, coming back to the refuge with little Rose. This reunification of Suzanne Brown with her daughter Rose attests to the broader role that the Grey Nuns played in caring for Irish emigrants and keeping their families together. The story of the miracle of Rose's marble is both remarkable and historically verifiable. The vast majority of the famine dead buried in a mass grave on the site of Montreal's fever sheds have left no trace of their existence. But the Grey Nuns kept meticulous records of the Irish orphans in their care. In their archival record entitled The Category of Orphans at Point St. Charles, dated March 19th, 1848, that you see on screen, Suzanne Brown and her three children, Bridget, age nine, 
Rose age seven and George are listed. They're the top three figures, in fact, listed in the document. The document stipulates that they are from County Galway. If you follow the cursor. They're from County Galway. And if you look at the remarks portion of the, uh, the document, we see that her mother is listed in being in the sheds. Their father is listed as having died in the sheds and both Bridget and Rose are reported to be with their mother in the Grey Nunnery. Indeed, the document provides confirmation that the little girl who rolled her marble across the church floor was reunited with her mother shortly thereafter. The sisters also record that Rose's brother George was later ordained a priest in the same parish, in the same parish of St. Hugh, where he found refuge, while Bridget did not leave the Grey Nuns until she went out to establish herself in the world. As for Rose herself, her fate is not recounted in the Grey Nuns' annals. Nevertheless, the miracle of Rose's marble was no mere fable, but a verifiable story corroborated, as I said, by archival records. These records are sufficiently detailed for Suzanne Brown's descendants to have traced their ancestry to the moment of her arrival in the sheds. Last year, I was contacted by Bridget Brown's great granddaughter, Christiane Cousineau, and her husband, Bertrand Souvier, who recounted how her ancestor survived her ordeal to start a new life in North America. Suzanne Brown was recalled by her descendants by her maiden name of Bridget O'Haverty, and her husband, who perished in the sheds, was named Michael. According to family lore, they had four children, an eldest son named Michael, who died on the transatlantic voyage in 1847, their younger son, George, who was born in Galway on July 17th, 1837, their eldest daughter, Bridget, or Bodelia, also born in Galway in 1838, and their youngest daughter, Mary Rose, or Rose Brown. George Brown was ordained a priest on January 29, 1860, and had a lengthy career in Quebec, and then in Troy and in Syracuse, New York, before he retired to his original parish, where he died in 1902. His mother, Suzanne Brown, and her two daughters, Bridget and Rose, continued to live in the Grey Nunnery after they were, re were, re re were reunited uh, as a family for several years. Bridget, or Bodelia Brown, married Augusta Cousineau on June 16, 1863, and then relocated with her mother to the town of Valcor in Quebec's eastern townships, where she bore nine children. In later life, Bodelia yearned to find living relatives in her native Galway, but she was bitterly disappointed when she made re the return voyage in 1885 and discovered no trace of them in her ancestral home. She died in Valcour in 1930 at the age of 92. And as for the youngest daughter, Mary Rose or Rose Brown, she never left the Grey Nunnery. She took the veil and became a Grey Nun herself under the name of Sister St. Patrice, Sister St. Patrick. She remained a Grey Nun until her early death from tuberculosis on May 19, 1865 at the age of 24. Shortly before she died, Mary Rose Brown had become the godmother for her sister Bodelia's daughter, Mary Rose Cousineau, who was born 10 months earlier and kept alive the family name. Indeed, the little girl who'd rolled her marble and found her mother in St. Patrick's Church in 1847 became Sister St. Patrice and a godmother after she was rescued with her siblings from the sheds. The miracle of Rose's marble attests to one family story of resilience and survival in the midst of a mortuary spectacle. Her rolling marble reminds us of the numerous families torn asunder by the famine migration and the restoration of just one on this occasion. Indeed, Rose Brown was but just one of countless children plucked from the arms of their dying mothers by the gray nuns at the height of the typhus epidemic. The vast majority of them were never reunited with their parents 
who were buried in North America's largest famine mass grave. These multitudes of famine dead left no trace of their existence beyond the memory of mass mortality that is recalled in the Grey Nun's annals and Tia Philhamel's painting, The Typhus. They both represent the Grey Nuns and other female religious orders in their compassion, devotion, and self-sacrifice as caregivers whom we commend as they minister to the sick and dying. They stand in the midst of a scene of mass death, but it is also one of resilience and survival. The figures in Theophil Hamel's painting are iconic, but they also challenge us to look again and not merely to see the famine migrants as an anonymous mass devoid of individual stories and individual identities. They had individual identities and stories of their own. Ultimately, the miracle of, Mar of Rose's mar marble provides a reminder that all 6,000 emigrants who lie buried in Montreal's mass grave were such individuals with lives cut short. Yet in scenes like this, Rose Brown survived and found her mother. She passed on her name to her niece, whose godmother she became. More broadly, in viewing the painting, we should not just see scenes of mass death and suffering, but also images of rescue and recovery of potential ancestors whose lineage we have yet to rediscover. Whether emigrant family trees were cut short or blossomed like the Browns after 1847, we honor their memory in seeking to find their stories. The Brown family story is just one that was passed on to subsequent generations. Their resilience should inspire us to see more than mortuary spectacles of the anonymous dead in the fever sheds they endured, as well as in the COVID wards that confront us now in the midst of our own pandemic. It should challenge us and inspire us to learn more about those lives cut short, both now and then. Finally, I want to conclude by acknowledging the work of the Montreal Irish Monument Park Foundation that has been seeking to commemorate these famine emigrants who lie in the city's mass grave. They've led a campaign to develop a famine memorial park on the site of the fever sheds in Montreal, which have been marked since 1859 by the black stone that was placed over the famine victim's mass grave, discovered by mainly Irish workers engaged in building the city's Victoria Bridge. Although the Black Rock is the first memorial to be erected to victims of the Great Hunger in North America, it is relatively inaccessible and unknown. Located in the median of a major traffic artery where most of the 6,000 Irish people who perished lie buried in derelict surroundings. One of the last living eyewitnesses of their suffering was the Grey Nun's sister, Martine Reed, who at the age of 80, on the 13th of November, 1899, recalled the Black Rock mass grave in vivid detail. In her own words, quote, I've never passed there and seen the stone without thinking of the scenes that I witnessed there in 1847. I saw numbers of bodies taken there to be buried each placed in a separate coffin, she claimed, where the monument now stands. The Montreal Irish Monument Park Foundation has been campaigning for 10 years to create a more dignified memorial space around the monument. It seems only fitting and proper to note that the Knights of Columbus, Montreal Council 284, has been a strong supporter of the foundation's campaign. Their efforts have been rewarded of late by the redevelopment of the Black Rock's derelict setting for a light rail system that has brought well-resourced semi-state corporations to work closely with Irish community members in creating the Memorial Park. Last November, Irish community members were invited to take part in an archeological excavation of part of the site, which is what you see in my final image on screen, in which some of the coffins observed by Sister Reed were respectfully and sensitively unearthed. It was a profoundly moving moment for those community members who will re inter their ancestors with full honors when the memorial park is, is complete. It is also a moment that should inspire us, and this is my final point, 
to learn more about those lives cut short whose fate the Black Rock marks. Thank you very much. Jason, thank you very much. Uh, your, your closing thoughts are uh, extremely powerful that we should be inspired and challenged to uh, keep alive this memory and learn more of uh, the service of the great nuns and uh, the hardships of uh, the immigrants. Um, I have a few questions that uh, I've collected during the course of your presentation and uh, participants, I'd invite you if you have additional questions, now's the time to submit them. Use the questions utility on the side of your screen and type in your question and I will, uh, I will uh, share them with uh, Dr. King. Jason, can you share with us at all the status of the gray nuns in their ministry uh, now in the 21st century? I, I, I can indeed. Like many uh, female religious orders, the, the gray nuns have not uh, recruited any, any, any new sisters in quite a while. And they are uh, in the process of winding down, you might say. They've... Uh, uh, they've bequeathed some of their properties to universities and educational institutions. Most of them are quite elderly now and living in a uh, in a purpose-built seniors' home. But uh, a lot of their archival work and their and their and their, and their ministry is, is is still going on relatively strong. And of course, the Grey Nuns uh, they were founded in Montreal, but they um, they established a number of other orders in the United States and in Canada, and uh, a, a, a number of uh, uh, health institutions and educational institutions were built up by them and are now, of course, uh, part of the fabric of the communities in, in which they, they were established. Remember when we we held the uh, the Grey Nuns and the Great Hunger exhibit uh, at Quinnipiac University, we were visited by some uh, some members of the Grey Nuns in the United States, uh, a more vibrant order, I think, than, than in, in Montreal currently, uh, where, where their ministry still goes very strong, I believe. Well, it's pleasing to know that the, the ministry continues. Can you talk about other formal outreach uh, to the, the the immigrants as they uh, as they arrived? Were there other organizations, other groups that uh, besides the the three communities, and really perhaps even besides just uh, uh, Catholic religious, was there some sort of uh, additional outreach? Uh, th th there were indeed. The Grey Nuns, the Sisters of Providence, and the Religious Hospitals of St. Joseph's were on, on the front line. You might say. Uh, in working in the sheds and caring directly for Irish immigrants, but they were working as well with the civic authorities uh, in Montreal. In fact, before the arrival of the uh, the famine immigrants, there had been very little contact between these uh, Catholic religious orders and enclosed religious order, in the case of the, the hospitals of St. Joseph, uh, who were predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly French-speaking and the predominantly English-speaking civil authorities in Montreal. They came together really to deal with the, uh, the, the, the very sudden crisis that was the arrival of the famine Irish. Um, but I, I, to make a couple of points, many members of the, uh, of the community then rallied around the, the Grey Nuns and these female religious to try to help care for famine immigrants. The Grey Nuns record in their annals that uh, British soldiers, of course, Montreal is a British city in the mid 19th century. British soldiers would come to the perimeter of the sheds to donate food, to donate money. Uh, the First Nations, the indigenous peoples in Montreal, in their oral tradition, recall donating to Irish famine relief efforts. I made the point that there was an intense sense of religious rivalry in the sheds in 1847. They were a contested religious space. But in practice, this spurred on both Catholics and Protestants to um, make greater efforts to care for immigrants from both religions. And what you had were Catholic sheds, Protestant sheds, Catholic sheds for orphans, Protestant sheds for orphans. And for the most part, I think this led to um, a kind of a, a rivalry that was beneficiary to the immigrants who were arriving. The Anglican Bishop uh, of Montreal, Jacob Bishop, visited the fever sheds in Montreal and, and as well at, at Beauceil further upriver. And a point that's not uh, not very well known in Montreal itself is that the mayor of Montreal, an American in fact, uh, lost his life in caring for famine immigrants, visiting the sheds, contracting typhus himself at the end of 1847. The mayor of Montreal, John Easton Mills, also died 
uh, alongside uh, many Tigrinans in, in, in caring for these elephants. So there were many people who, who, who came together to try to alleviate the suffering of, 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 our, of Irish immigrants during this period, although I think the Grey Nuns were the most visible and, and were there for the longest. Um, you've, you've provided a link here for us, Jason, uh, regarding the, the monument and the effort to uh, keep alive the memory of that era, uh, the Ministry of the Grey Nuns and others. Um, are there other other works, other publications that uh, are available? Is there a place or a resource that people can go to to learn more detail about that time and that outreach? Well, I think the most uh, the most valuable resource, the most precious resource, is the one that I've been uh, making reference to. It's it's the annals of the great nuns themselves telling their story. Uh, all of it is available, freely available online uh, to read at your leisure. And these are very powerful, very gripping stories that we find in their documents. Uh, it's famine archive at nuigalway.ie. Uh, there's lots of different uh, uh, accounts, not just from the Grey Nuns, but the Sisters of Providence as well. And uh, I would highly encourage people just to open those annals. They're translated into English and read the stories. They're really, really gripping and, and powerful stories. And they, I think they still resonate now as much as they did in the past. And uh, we have a comment from um, from one of the great nuns of the Sacred Heart, and she claims that she's met you previously at Quinnipiac, and um, wants to emphasize that the great nuns ministry continues. Uh, she's now in Queens, New York, and that of course has been an epicenter of uh, the COVID virus uh, here in the United States. So uh, we thank you, sisters, for your your continued outreach to uh, those in need. Those uh, suffering illness. Um, if uh, if anyone else has any further questions, uh, I invite you to offer them now. We're, uh, we'll pause for just an additional uh, moment. We thank uh, Dr. King for sharing his research and for the information about where we can follow up uh, to learn more about uh, about the time of the famine Irish and their experience upon arrival in in Canada and uh, well, British North America. All right then, well, thank you, Jason. Uh, we're, we're very grateful for your, uh, your information as I noted. Um, for further questions about this or for uh, other topics in general that we've covered in these sessions, please email museum at ko c.org. Uh, there will be a short hiatus in these presentations, but notice will be provided in advance of the next session. So until then, good health and God bless. Thank you, Peter. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You.